Yes, we are recording. Thank you. Um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am calling this regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4.30 p.m. on October 27th, 2022, um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 21 and extended by Chapter 22 and Chapter 107 of the Acts of 22. This meeting will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to take attendance of the call the role of the Community Resources Committee members to make sure that um, they can hear us and we can hear them. Um, we'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Uh, present. And Mandy Johanneke is president. Present. Um, Pam Ernie. Present. And Jennifer Taub. Present. And Shalini is not here yet. We will catch her when she comes in though. Um, with that, we're going to start immediately into our public hearings. Um, so let me get that script up. And so in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A, uh, this public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. This is actually a continued public hearing um, that began on May 26th and continued on September 8th and September 29th of 2022. Um, and it is on zoning by law, Article 2, zoning districts, Article 3, use regulations, and Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district, to see if the town will vote to add Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district to the zoning bylaw, amend Article 2, zoning districts, to add FEMA floodplain overlay district, and amend related sections of Article 3, use regulations, to regulate activities in the 100-year floodplain, as shown on the flood insurance rate maps issued by FEMA. For the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program, firm maps indicate areas that have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The purpose of the floodplain management regulations is to protect public health, safety, and general welfare and to minimize the harmful impacts of flooding upon the community. Um, so we are opening or we're continuing this public hearing. Um, Chris or Nate, would you like to address this one? And it's starting at 432. I believe I started reading all of that. Um, Chris or Nate, would you like to address this portion of the public hearing and any changes or anything that have been gone on? I have a short intro and then Nate is going to go into the particulars. Okay. So I just wanted to update the CRC members about where we are with the project. We've been talking to town council about flood mapping since the council was established and we've been working on the project since 2012. There have been a number of delays in moving forward, but we're finally in a position where the CRC and the planning board can make recommendations to town council. So as Mandy Jo stated, this has been a continuing public hearing. Initially, the town council referred the project, um, four parts of the project, to both the planning board and the CRC. Um, actually, the CRC only received, the planning board only received referral for the zoning portion. But in any event, um, we finally received our letter of final determination in August, and the maps um, have finally arrived. They arrived sometime in mid-October, and that was one of the reasons for all of the delay. As you know, the town of Amherst is a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is administered by FEMA. The pro program provides flood insurance for property owners whose properties are subject to flooding. If the municipality in which the property is located participates in the National Flood Insurance Program. I'm not going to repeat a lot of the things I told you earlier on in previous meetings about the history of the project, um, but I would like to mention the fact that the old maps from 1983 were based on USGS topography with 10 foot contour intervals, and they're also based on data gathered up until the early 1970s, and the new maps are based on Amherst GIS topography, which is one foot contour inter intervals. They're also based on more recently gathered data. And this means that the new maps are much more accurate in terms of where the flooding occurs. So the action steps that the town needs to take are that the town council needs to 
um, adopt the FEMA maps, the firm maps, and the flood insurance study, which I think you're going to be talking about later in this meeting, possibly. Um, and the town also needs to adopt associated zoning amendments and changes to the official zoning map. And the CRC and the planning board are called upon to make um, recommendations on the uh, zoning portions of this um, project. And the CRC needs to make a recommendation to town council on the firm maps and the flood insurance study. So um, if the town fails to adopt the new maps, the town of Amherst will no longer be able to participate in the flood insurance program and people in Amherst won't be able to purchase flood insurance through the flood insurance program. So now Nate Malloy is here to present the zoning amendment articles 2, 3, 16 and the new flood maps um, to you and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for that. Before Nate starts, I just need to confirm that Shalini can hear us. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, Nate. <laughs> sure, thanks. So, you know, as part of the um, being in the firm program, we have to have local regulations to regulate development in the floodplain. And the simplest solution was to take the model bylaw provided by FEMA in the state and then, you know, and that becomes the proposed Article 16. Um, in doing so, we have to then reference uh, changes in Article 2 and Article 3. So, you know, Article 2, I'll, I'll share my screen, is um, uh, most disabled screen sharing. All right. Um, so Article 2 is... Athena, can you, can you let us, uh, Nate, share screen? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. It's a new default setting. Yeah. <laughs> I encountered that uh, earlier. Great. Thanks, Athena. The, um, if, is that visible for everyone? Um, yes. Yeah, so this hasn't changed since, um, you know, for a number of months. And so really in Article 2, we're defining the new zoning district. So the FEMA floodplain overlay district. And it, it's really a, uh, what Mandy read in terms of the um, legal ad, it's the, you know, the area that's the 1% chance of flooding. Um, and, you know, that's been confirmed by the new maps and the flood insurance study. And so, you know, the changes to Article 2 is really now, just, you know, describing the district. Um, in Article 3, the town zoning bylaw, it's use regulations. And so there's a few sections where we, we mentioned development and floodways. Uh, one is in section 3.13, where it's a, its own discrete section. And so we're just providing new language proposed here, see also article 16, um, just to direct people. So rather than trying to change everything in the bylaw, uh, the states reviewed this, um, the state uh, FEMA, you know, the state representative who works with FEMA and says, this is a fine approach. Um, and then we have our flood prone conservancy district, which is a base zoning district, and that's not proposed to be changed. So similarly, now we have our FPC and we have the FEMA, which is separate. Um, and now we're going to have the FPC, which will remain, and then also the FEMA, which is an overlay. So we're saying, you know, proposed language here uh, to say, you know, that um, that the FEMA and the new the new proposed FEMA overlay district will take precedent over any less restrictive language in the FPC district. And so, you know, someone will have to read both, and um, it's pretty clear what, you know, what um, what is less restrictive or more restrictive. FEMA does allow development. You know, our FBC doesn't in a lot of cases. And so um, our local FBC bylaw, uh, um, in some instances, is more restrictive than FEMA. And then really the, the big one is Article 16, which has been looked at, the CRC looked at it, the planning board has looked at it. Um, it's based on an updated model from the state from 2020. Uh, the revision date is October 21. This incorporates all changes that has been discussed at the previous hearings. Um, so there's an intent and purpose. There were some comments about some grammar in here and spelling. We've added since the last time, um, 1606, to allow the floodplain to operate naturally and drain floodwaters without development that could add to flooding. Um, so we've, you know, we have a number of purposes here. Really, it's public safety, um, protection of buildings and property. The definitions uh, are from a, you know, the standard uh, FEMA language. One change is um, from last time we and, and right in the beginning here we say that the definitions really only apply within the overlay district. That's always been the case. 
but we say that these definitions are based on state building code, standard references found in state building code, and then FEMA regulations found in the code of federal regulations. And we did this because after every um, defined term previously, we had actually parenthetically referenced a, a specific section in the code or something. And the acknowledgement was if that was ever changed, then every, every section in this bylaw, every definition would have to be changed. And so, um, you know, we, we put this, uh, this one kind of generic statement up top and otherwise the definitions have not changed. Um, you know, we've modified them slightly from the FEMA language to apply to Amherst or make things uh, more understandable. So, um, you know, for instance, start of construction, we, we've changed this language. It was changed previously, but, you know, we really say it um, is the issuance of a building permit and work must start 180 days from that building permit. Uh, and then for FEMA's purposes, what it means for the first placement of a permanent uh, construction. And so, you know, if you looked at the FEMA standard um, kind of template, this would be one paragraph and we separated it out just for clarity. FEMA defines a structure and repair of foundation. Again, this is only within the overlay district. And so, you know, the bylaw itself may have a definition for something. The building code may have a definition, but uh, when it comes to work in the floodplain, uh, you know, this is what, you know, when it says repair of a foundation, we separate it out into A and B. Um, the building commissioner understands this. So we have these definitions. Um, we have to designate a floodplain administrator. We're recommending the planning director. And then in the planning director's absence, their designee. We used to define that, say, as a senior planner or a certain position, but the designee is fine. And that can happen uh, in an absence or, um, you know, planned absence. You know, we do list the duties of the flood floodplain administrator, and these were modified slightly. Uh, one big one is may include. So the bylaws don't have to include every, you know, every job description of the floodplain administrator. Some don't. Uh, we we did this in terms of just providing guidance both to the town and to applicants, you know, what, what the floodplain administrator does. So it says may include, and then it lists these things. And so um, you know, it's, it's pretty thorough. Um, we did take out some language here about notifying FEMA. We used to have specific addresses and, you know, locations, and we've just notified, you know, we just kept this, um, the flood plan administrator on the FEMA risk analysis, just so that again, if something changes, the bylaw doesn't have to change. And then really it's these regulations are the, um, you know, 16.3 is what, uh, what regulates development and actions in the floodplain. And so, um, you know, the big one is local permitting 16.31. We have to have um, some type of permit or review for every development. And so, <clears throat> you know, we're saying that, you know, a permit is required for all proposed construction uh, in the overlay district, including new construction, changes to existing buildings, placement of manufactured homes, agricultural facilities, fill, shed, storage facilities, drilling, mining, paving. This is FEMA language. What we've added is in addition to any building permit or other local, state, or federal permits needed, any development in the FEMA floodplain overlay district shall require a review by the wetlands administrator to determine if review and approval by the Conservation Commission is required. And so this is actually happening now with our new permitting software. So anytime there's a building permit or electrical permit, it's in the floodplain, the, the wetlands administrator has to, um, you know, approve it before it can move forward. And so, um, you know, we don't see this as a big step, but it does mean any, you know, any permit in that area will be reviewed and then there can be notes. And so that's really what FEMA wants to know, that we're monitoring any activity or development in the floodplain. Um, you know, these are the rest standard um, regulations from FEMA. We did add that where site plan review uh, under Article 11 of the bylaw, um, they shall incorporate these standards in review if there's a subdivision being proposed. And so just an acknowledgement that, um, you know, it's not just the construction of homes, it's also the planned development. So through subdivision, if someone's proposing to, you know, put roadways in or other things, that is also applicable. Uh, let's see, so these are, you know, these haven't changed really at all. Um, since last time we there's some some recommendations to clean up some language, you know, very small grammatical things. 
And then enforcement, we've named the building commissioner. At one point we had the wetlands administrator or another staff person, but really it's the building commissioner. Uh, they are the zoning enforcement officer. Again, this section is uh, somewhat redundant. We have an enforcement section in the zoning bylaw, but um, you know it's nice to call it out here just so that it's something we can rely on if there is any question uh, as to what, how or why we're enforcing the FEMA overlay district. And so those are the three pieces of the bylaw. Um, an important thing is the bylaw has to reference the, the approval date. So in our letter of final determination, these approved local regulations need to be approved by FEMA by February 9, 2023. And so typically uh, the local adoption should occur, you know, four to six weeks before that deadline to give, you know, once these are approved locally, we send them to the state for their final review again, and then they send them to FEMA. And so our local bylaw uh, has to reference that date um, and it, it does above. And so, um, you know, really that's the important piece that the flood insurance study and the maps are all from February 9th. So I'm just gonna do a quick share. So now if you go to the FEMA map center, they're under pending products. They list all the map panels here with the date of um, February 9th. So the effective date is February 9th, 2023. And there's also the flood insurance study um, with a date of um, February 9th, 2023. And so what those panels look like um, here, so we have a web page. It's been updated. It's under the planning department. We have the pending firm maps and an interactive comparison map. I was I downloaded one of the maps, um, but there are very large files. <laughs> I'll try downloading it again. And so what's nice about these. Um, you know, the old ones were based on somewhat inaccurate, both um, base data and then, you know, like Chris mentioned 10 foot contours. The new maps are based on aerial photographs, one foot contours, and then, uh, you know, very detailed analysis of stream profiles and elevations. And so we can zoom in on these. What's nice about them is we can see a structure through the transparent layer of the FEMA uh, floodplain. So typically on the old map, it was really hard to tell if a structure was in or out of the floodplain. Um, here, we can have a better visual understanding. And then there's, with, you know, with each area of a floodplain, there's also an elevation associated with it. So sometimes we'll ask actually a property owner to have a survey um, to determine if it's you know, in the floodplain or not. But this is what the new maps look like. Uh, they haven't changed much really in the last two years. There's been, Chris mentioned some delays, and some of those delays were technical in nature in terms of providing certain labels on cross sections, uh, standardizing some of the, the legends and the, how the maps presented uh, in terms of how the data has changed in, um, in the Northwest corner of Amherst, there was some, some missing uh, floodplain. It wasn't as if the data, the data had caught it, but it wasn't mapped correctly. So, you know, like this blue area wasn't shown uh, on the opposite side of town. And so really the, the data hasn't changed that used that developed this in a few years. It was really just the production of the maps themselves that have, has caused the delay. And so this is what you know, each panel will look like. Um, they're actually you know, a 24 by 36 sheet. So when we actually have them in paper copy, each sheet is really big. Um, and then we have them digitally here through FEMA. In terms of how it's changed, the interactive map, it's a slider map. Uh, and so both layers are available right now. We'll just zoom in. So the, the yellow is the previous or the current the 83 map and the, we'll say blue is the, is the new map. And you can just see the articulation of the boundaries is a lot more detailed following contours. And so what you can do with this map, you can have it, sorry, it's really sensitive. It can be a swipe map. Uh, which is now you know becoming more popular, but you can slide back and forth. So you can really zoom in on an area to see you know how things have changed. And so you know this will remain in effect just for even uh, applicants and the public to see. And so if you zoom around town, you can just see where previously the contours weren't as defined. So even in this area uh, behind Belchertown Road, and now it looks you know the floodplain is is like this. So the actual river, Fort River is here. And based on topography, more accurate topography and flood elevations, you know, this area right here is now excluded. 
So wherever you just see yellow, it's no longer part of the floodplain. And so the overlay district really is just this blue area. So when we say it applies to the FEMA floodplain, you know, um, the regulated area, the overlay and all those regulations we just looked at is just this blue area. So we can, um, and so that's really what it is. So the, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. So the regulations, you can see most of town is not in the FEMA overlay district. So right, any, any place that is not, covered by this is not regulated by anything we just looked at. So it really only applies strictly to, you know, this area. Um, you know, you can just see the accuracy of the new maps. So uh, that's, I guess that's it. If there's any questions, I can stop share or, or move around town if people have questions. Thank you, Nate. Um, we'll move into the questions. Are there any questions from CRC members? Pam. Hi, Nate, can you go back to section 16.1? It's one of the definitions, please. And it has to do with, <clears throat> it's the- 16.1, um, 16 it's actually the very beginning of that section. And it says, if I'm reading it correctly on my copy, the following defin definitions comply with FEMA region one standards shall apply only within the FEMA floodplain overlay district. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I was reading that as our as our flood prone conservancy district. So that I just answered my own question. Okay. I was trying to figure out if there was ever a situation where where the floodplain overlay would be would be outside of the flood prone conservancy. So it will it, there there will there will be there will be areas where the FPC is bigger than FEMA and other places where FEMA is bigger than FPC. So, um, okay, but I think, but, but I, but I did answer my own question. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. It's okay, Pam, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the committee? Seeing none, this is a public hearing. Are there any questions um, from the public that are in attendance regarding the floodplain, basically what Nate just summarized. If there are, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, are there any comments from the public on the floodplain summary that Nate just gave and the zoning changes? Seeing none, do CRC members have any other questions? Seeing no questions, I'm gonna make a motion at this time to close the public hearing on zoning bylaw article two, zoning districts article three, use regulations and article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. Is there a second? Second. second. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer beat me. Jennifer gets the Whoever. second. <laughs> With that, um, any discussion? Seeing none, we're going to go to a vote. Shalini? Yes. Mandy is an aye. Uh, Pat? Did What did you say, Mandy Jo? Because we're my... voting to close the hearing. Yes, I heard that part, but then now oh, you're frozen again, or I'm frozen. Oh, sorry, I, I, which... I called on you, Pat, to vote. I. <laughs> <laughs> Pam. Yes. And Jennifer. Aye. That is unanimous to close the hearing. We will move on to our next hearing, which is a continued hearing on, um, where's my script again? So it is now 454 and we are in accordance with the provisions of MGL chapter 40A. We are con opening this, this continued public hearing of the community resources of the town of Amherst, uh, the Amherst Town Council. Um, which has been duly noticed, duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw, zoning bylaw official zoning map FEMA floodplain overlay district.
to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to add FEMA floodplain overlay district for the purpose of regulating activities as described in Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district. Um, I think I said that at 454, we are opening it. This is continued from May 26th, September 8th, and September 29, 2022. Nate, would you like to add anything to what you just said regarding uh, to, to the prior hearing? I know we've described this multiple times. No, thanks. I, I don't think so. Um, just, you know, like I, I can reiterate that the overlay will be tied to the FEMA boundaries that were shown on the interactive map. So just the, the proposed you know, new regulated areas. And so, um, so the second hearing is really, you know, for that overlay piece. So the regulations will only affect that overlay. So they work, you know, they work together. Um, otherwise the, the, you know, article 16 doesn't apply anywhere unless the overlay is in place. Thank you, Nate. Are there any questions from CRC members? Seeing none, are there any questions from the public? If there are, please raise your hand at this time. And this is again on the FEMA, the actual overlay map, the zoning map will change with, as Nate said, all of the blue that was in that map he was showing. Seeing no questions, are there any comments from the public? Seeing no hands for public comment on the zoning map. Any further questions from CRC members? Seeing none, I'm going to make a motion to close the hearing on zoning bylaw official zoning map FEMA floodplain overlay district. Is there a second? Second, Shalini. Thank you, Shalini. Any discussion on the motion to close the hearing? Seeing none, we're going to vote. We're going to start with Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. And Shalini. Yes. That is also unanimous. Um, so we are closed with the hearings. Um, I'm going to ask the committee if they think we can get through four more motions in the next two minutes <laughs> on these matters. I think. I think. Oh, we on rental registration, sure. And then we'll move on to rental registration. <laughs> think we can finish this up in about two minutes? I told I told Attorney Goldberg we'd get to her at five. Seeing some shakes of the heads, I'm just going to make some motions. Um, I'm going to make a motion to recommend the town council adopt the proposed revisions to Article 2 zoning districts, Article 3 use regulations, Article 16, and Article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district as presented. Um, as presented. Is there second. a second? Uh, that was Jennifer. Yeah. Oh, Pat. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Pat, Pat seconded that. Any, any discussion on that? Seeing none, we start with Mandy. Mandy's an I. Um, oh, Pam, you just got. Yep. No. Okay. Um, Pam, are you ready to vote? Yep, I. Okay, Jennifer? I. Shalini? Yes. And Pat? I. We will make that re that recommendation is unanimous. Um, I'm going to make a second motion, a motion to recommend the town council adopt zoning bylaw official zoning map flood, FEMA floodplain overlay district. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Pam Rooney, thank you for that. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we start with Pam. Aye. Jennifer? Aye. Shalini? Yes. Uh, Pat? Aye. And Mandy is an aye. That is also unanimous. Um, we'll move on to the flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study. Those votes and discussions discussion and recommendations. Um, I'm going to start with a motion on the flood insurance rate maps is to recommend that I move to recommend the town council adopt the flood insurance or approve. Is, Chris, is it approve or Nate, is it approve or adopt these maps? I believe it's adopt. Is that right? Okay. Is that right, Nate? Right, we adopt them and they're approved by FEMA. Gotcha. So I'm going to move to recommend that the town council adopt the flood insurance rate maps is as presented. Is there a second? Really? Thank you, Pam. Is there any discussion? I will say that these are the same maps that we just recommended would be the floodplain overlay district. 
Seeing no discussion, we'll start with Jennifer, I think. Aye. Um, Chalani? Yes. Um, Pat? Aye. Mandy is an aye, and Pam? Aye. And then we've got one last one, and then we will move on to rental registration. And this is to, I move to recommend that the town council adopt the flood insurance study um, with a final approval date of when it's, a, I think right now we don't have the final date on it. So when the final date changes with that date represented on the study itself. At least I couldn't find a copy that it said preliminary the last time I saw a copy, so. I, I received a copy in um, the mail. Excellent. And it has a date revised February 9th, 2023. There we go, with the date February 9th, 2023. <laughs> 2023. <laughs> it does have a date on it. <laughs> That's the one we're moving to adopt or recommend adoption of. Is there a second to that motion? Okay, Rooney. Thank you, Pam. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, we're back around to Shalini. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, okay. Yes, Pam. Before before we finish yeah. off, I really would like to say thank you to the town staff for yes. shepherding this thing through the process. <clears throat> um, I'm very happy to support it and, and make the recommendation to town council that they also adopt it. So um, thank you. Yes, 10 years may be a record. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the final vote in CRC on these flood maps. Um, we're starting with Shalini. Yes. Uh, Pat. Aye. Uh, Mandy is an aye. Pam. Aye. And Jennifer. Aye. With a unanimous vote, congratulations, Chris <laughs> and Nate. You are done at CRC with flood maps. <laughs> Good luck at, at the planning board next week with them. And then on to FEMA. Yeah. Thank you. Um, with that, I want to, we will go to item 3C on our agenda, which is residential rental bylaw. Um, I want to welcome, welcome attorney Goldberg here for this discussion. Um, and I saw a, attorney Goldberg that in the audience is uh, Michael Dior Tenzio, would you like him brought in for this discussion? Oh, you're muted. I always do that. So, you know, that was my one time, I hope. Um, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, sure, Michael, Michael would be very welcome to join. He also took a close look at these regulations and bylaw and would be, uh, you know, if he needs, if he wants to add anything, I think that would be useful. Thank you. So I think Athena, you're in the middle of bringing him in. So welcome to attorney DiRotenzio too. Um, thank you both for coming today for this discussion. Um, what we're going to have for the attendees in the audience is a discussion and conversation with the town attorneys regarding um, in uh, specifically the questions that were asked them, but in general, the, the, the concepts surrounding the questions that were sent to KP Law. Um, regarding rental permitting and, and um, what we can and can't do, um, specifically as it relates to landlord-tenant law in specific, because that's what we'll be dealing with with rental permitting. Um, and so, uh, Attorney Goldberg, would you like to just start? Um, we can do this either by going through the questions or just taking those concepts and saying what you might be concerned about or not concerned about um, based on the questions that were sent. Well, I don't want to ignore the questions because you went to such trouble to write them all. No, I'm kidding. Um, I think that we can have a general discussion and maybe actually move through the bylaw itself and kind of look at some of the issues that we have. Um, the Let me just, I just want to get it up on my screen so that I am, because I lost you guys before and I couldn't open it. So now I'm back. And if you think it would be helpful to put it as a shared screen, we can do that too. I am happy to, although I would like to provide a caveat that um, it is it is not intended to be a formal response from council. And I assure you, we will provide something more specific in writing um, that looks better and is you know more appropriate for a release. So, all right. Um, so your first question, and Mandy Joe, please, Madam Chair, if there's anything that I'm not covering that you want me to, or 
any questions that come up, I'm happy to answer as we go. So no issue. And then, oh, I want to show the comments too here. Yes. And so with that, with that, Attorney Goldberg, I would just say if any committee members have any questions or want to delve in deeper into any areas, want clarification, want to ask additional questions related to them, just raise your hand and, and we'll have that conversation. We're going to be doing this until about 520, um, unless we end early. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay, I think I can get there now. So review, show. Comments. Why doesn't it want to show? Oh, that makes it too big. All right, I think um, I think I'm gonna figure this out. So to make the whole screen smaller. Okay. I never have computer problems when people aren't watching me. I just want that to be known. <laughs> if you try the minus at the bottom on the right hand side, yeah, I couldn't get to it because the bar was in front of it. And okay. there you go see if we can get it. okay so um i know this is kind of small but i'm going to explain anyway so the first question that you you all had was about the penalty section and the difference between non-criminal disposition and um you know enforcement um in the district court by indictment and essentially um the the way in which this typically works is that if this were a matter that went to court the court would have the uh, flexibility, the discretion to issue a fine of up to $300. And that's it. That's the limit for not for, for bylaws, for both non-criminal and the criminal version. Um, so in terms of the difference, you know, one involves filing a complaint and having someone go. And usually in response to can someone else go, it's usually the police prosecutor um, if you have one, uh, but we certainly could talk about whether the court would be comfortable um, with a different person. I think we'd have to figure out how to um, explain who they are and, and all of that. I know the building inspector wouldn't usually go to court by themselves. They usually um, go through you know, counsel or uh, the police prosecutor, I would imagine. Um, so we can follow up on that based on what you guys are doing right now. And um, what what it is that you'd like to accomplish for that. Um, but uh, could a small table of examples be provided? Oh, so you're saying like the building inspector could go for building code violations. That's the kind of table that you're looking for? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so because enforcement um, is essentially the prosecution of a claim, Typically, that would have to go through the executive to get authorization to do so um, because it's an expenditure of municipal resources and because um, there are some things that may not be um, as critical or there could be budget issues or uh, some some situations like that. So um, I, I think we should talk to Paul and see what what he does now with regard to building inspector and zoning enforcement officer, health director, police chief, um, and see what they're doing now. Um, if if they're each now uh, filing without conferring with the town manager and um, prosecuting without the use of town council or the police prosecutor, uh, it's likely that we could do the same thing here. Um, the fact that there are so many potential enforcing authorities was one of the things I wanted to mention. Um, I know that certainly, you know, that under the state sanitary code and electrical code and uh, fire code, and what am I missing? The um, gas and wires, all of that. Uh, there are particular persons who are authorized to enforce those. And so, you know, it seems to me that in kind of connection with this as a theme, it is very much the case that a lot of these things seem to be addressed in state law already or state law regulations. And I don't know what the committee's thought process is, um, but I'm interested to hear, but was the goal to try to put everything in one place, even though in theory, um, you know, it could be done under state law, not as coordinated, you know, without, without this bylaw. 
I'll try and take that. I think thank you. I I think the committee isn't sure and it's not a well, we haven't had that particular discussion is what I'll say. Okay. Um, there has been a desire to bring some of those into like if you violate a sanitary code that you also violate this code and that mm -hmm. discussion has sort of said, but we've recently received a number of comments that um, from the public that say, should we be doing that? And mm -hmm. so I believe it's probably a discussion we'll return to as to mm -hmm. whether we want to bring them in and make them both a violation of their own right mm -hmm. and also a violation here recommendations yep. that you have or thoughts you have on that i know i would appreciate hearing oh absolutely um am i jumping in front of anyone else wanting to talk or okay um so um it's it's our kind of general approach that we don't have to restate what exists in state law, meaning, you know, if 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 the standards that we're holding these rentals to is compliance with the state sanitary code, then we can just say that's the standard, um, and you know, any violation of the state sanitary code would be a violation of this bylaw or is a violation of this bylaw as well, because it's not a criminal issue. There's no like double jeopardy or anything like that. Um, so yeah, you can be fined both locally and at the state. The state sanitary code covers a lot of what you all are trying to do. Um, it doesn't connect it to rentals, but the, the, the code itself has a, a number of standards and, and uh, authorizations. It defines, for example, life safety problem, which isn't defined in this. Um, and, and so there's some benefit of using what already exists either in the zoning bylaws or in the state law to, um, to kind of work to your advantage in this without having to say it all again. Um, but, you know, I, I know this is consistent with the way that you all usually have bylaws. They're very specific. We get questions with subparagraphs. We got a lot of subparagraphs here, and that's always the case. Um, I think the important thing is to recognize that if a, if a, code enforcement officer has authority under the um, code, you know, the state sanitary code, the enforcement action is taken as the state sanitary, you know, as enforcement of the state sanitary code. And basically what we're saying here is that if there's a state sanitary code violation, it's going to be deemed a, a violation of the bylaw and that has implications for the owner. Um, so, so again, I think thinking about using terms that exist, whether they're in the zoning bylaw or in the state sanitary code may be a good idea. And it also may be worthwhile to say, you know, to the extent the, the code enforcement aspect of this um, varies from state laws that may be amended from time to time, this is not meant to supersede those standards with regard to the, the, the standards that the code officer is looking at. And that way, I think we have a good argument to say, hey, this bylaw stands on its own. If the, if the state sanitary code requires something else, then that's what we're gonna do. And if it requires less, then that's what we're gonna do. You could, of course, also just amend the regulations. Um, and I will talk about that in a bit, but the, the bylaw is a little more work to amend. So it's worth, I think, thinking about. Um, in the definition section, uh, you know, we have, we like right away come up with this issue. So the building commissioner and the zoning enforcement officer are both the same person. That's really good typing, Lauren, um, in the zoning, um, the zoning bylaws. And so, you know, I don't know if you want to write out both, you can, but they are, they are the same. Um, although the building commissioner has authority, uh, different authority under different statutes, as you know. And here, actually, very timely is my comment about, um, you know, thinking about using those definitions that already exist, whether in statute or in the zoning bylaw, rather than defining existing um, definitions differently. Like you're not going to find the rental, uh, which I'm going to call it, um, you know, you're not going to find a person in charge, right? There's no person in charge definition, your definition. Um, you're not going to find a resident manager, except maybe in a, um, you could, uh, you could um, compare it to the 
um, responsible manager under the liquor licensing process. So for those, I think, um, you know, you really do need to have uh, a definition in here. Um, so anyhow, but I, I can talk certainly and I can make some suggestions in writing. Obviously, this is intended just to have a conversation. You all have brought this to this point and, um, you know, we want to help you get it over the line in terms of reducing potential risk because Mandy Joe, as I know, you know, I always say this, I am a, a risk averse person when it comes to, to bylaws. Um, I always kind of go to the worst case scenario. And so sometimes what I'm saying sounds like no, but really that's a policy decision for you all to make. And I'm trying to be very aware of that as we go through. And if anyone, you know, again, if anyone wants to say, what do you mean by that? Please, please do. Um, okay, so that was the first. Um, so I, I guess another thing to think about for this code enforcement officer going to court to enforce um, to enforce a uh, violation or, or to, to force a violation. One of the questions may be, would they, they probably won't go under this bylaw anyway. They go under the, the state sanitary code or the electrical code or the zoning bylaw. This bylaw seems to me more of a bridge between that type of violation and the permission to rent units in town. Okay. Um, so green was what again, Mandy Jo, something you're thinking about? So, so green was stuff we just haven't decided. We actually changed the person in charge definition recently to instead of do 20 air miles, mm -hmm. reference counties. So right now we're moving away from the distance to Hampshire, Franklin, and Hamden County, but okay. they'd still have to live within that a jurisdictional yeah. framework. And and I think, you know, for every one of these, the question has to be, um, you know, do we have a rational reason, a, a, a rationally based uh, purpose for, for this law? And so, you know, for example, for that, you know, I was thinking, well, how far do firefighters have to live? Um, how far can firefighters live? How, how far can police officers live? Is there a reason for that as compared to this? So I think, you know, expanding into the counties is probably a really good idea um, because the, the rationale appears to be we want someone close enough to actually get here, right? Not like three days later. Um, so I think giving the choice about the counties is, um, is a good one, defensible. Um, okay, so the uh, idea of the person in charge being not being a current tenant of the owner. You wanna tell me what the rationale is for that? There have been concerns in town that um, particularly, I think in duplexes more than in any other locations um, mm -hmm. that um, there are, that, that a landlord will name one of the tenants as a person in charge, even though that tenant has what could be considered no qualifications to be sort of a manager and they're not receiving reduced rent for that. They're not that, but it's a way for the landlord and the property owner to quote, have someone, even though um, there might not be any experience at all or any yeah. intention for them to really be taking over because they might be still residing with friends they don't really think they can challenge or or do control over. We've heard concerns about that, which would mm -hmm. be why we had that in there. Although we did say if there's that reduced rent and an employee relationship that can be a tenant, but. Yeah. Um, okay. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I, I don't know if maybe there's something I'm not in my own office. So excuse me while I fetch it. Um, I, um, I, I can understand that. And I think, again, I think that makes sense and it's defensible. Um, the one thing about it that just kind of seemed a little bit funny is that if, if the owner intends to let person X do this job and they do a bad job, really it's the owner who's going to get in trouble for that. Um, so if, um, and if the owner, if the person in charge is the owner, then, 
you know, it just, it's because the person in charge couldn't uh, an owner um, designate themselves as the person in charge. Yes, they can, as long as they live within that geographic okay. area. Okay, all right. Um, resident managers, yes, okay. So uh, the next thing, oh, I, I not, just noted here that the definitions that you have in the exemptions section, it may be worth thinking about putting them up into the definition section. I noticed that I had to go back and forth. I was like, wait, what's a blah, blah, blah. And I had to like go further into the bylaw to find it. So organizationally, I think it's fine. Legally, it's fine. Just kind of a, a readability issue. Um, okay. This advertisement issue. Um, so right now, it's my Hold understanding. On. Before you start on that, yeah. um, that is one, I think I talked last week that we had actually deleted that in our conversation that happened after we said that. So okay. advertising no longer would have to, we've deleted that sentence completely. Okay. Um, and within that, we've also deleted, um, we've deleted the offer to rent requirement. So it's just operate rent operate okay. or rent. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think, again, you know, just kind of reading this with an eye towards land, landlord tenant law and contracts law, um, I think the, you know, the, the more restrictive this is, the, the more um, difficult it may be to, to defend. Um, so I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that's very reasonable. Okay. All right. So Oh yeah, here it is. Nothing shall supersede, alter or vary the requirements of the law. I wonder if we put that up front after the the mission and the purpose for the point of like bringing to people's attention, hey, those codes are those codes. This is this about rentals. It might be useful to kind of focus on that. So having it as its own section? Yeah, I, I just wonder if that's useful. And then I was also thinking, Mandy Jo, I know the purpose behind this is to ensure that landlords maintain their property. Um, and giving a ticket get what the town wants to do. Enforcing isn't what the town wants to do. The town wants people to comply with their obligations under law. So I'm wondering if you also put that up front, um, you know, that, that the town's goal is to ensure compliance um, for safety purposes and that, you know, the, the, um, the use of fines is kind of, um, I don't know. I don't know the right way to say. It. Kind of a um, meant is meant to encourage compliance, but not the town's first priority, right? Like you, you all want them to do the right thing, and you know, I know you're usually and you are so transparent in terms of what your reasoning is and all of that. So I thought it may make sense to say that. It also shifts the kind of I don't know, like the way it hits because it's like, hey, you know. This is, we, we don't want to do all these things, you know, this is a lot of work for us, but we will because if we need to. Um, and, and I think that kind of that issue of cooperation, having that, um, you know, at the front, I, I think that looks more like a partnership with the landlords and the students than it does kind of us telling them what they're doing or should or shouldn't do. Um, okay, you, oh, sorry, you asked about the definition of occupant. So any person sleeping in a dwelling. So my my um, my brother lives in Florida. His family comes up. They're supposed to stay a week. They stay three weeks. I I you know I'm not renting to them, but they're not. You know they wouldn't count. I don't think they should count towards. You know this. I, so. My, the, that was my roundabout way of saying, is it sleeping in on a regular basis? Is it sleeping in permanently? Is it, um, 
a lot of people crash on couches, as we know. And so are we, you know, are we addressing that? And I, I really didn't feel like that was the intent of the bylaws to deal with rooms being rented. Um, so I don't know if there's a way to do it. I didn't do anything to it, but I thought about it. Um, so that's something. Uh, okay, what else? Oh, before we move on, it looks like Pam's got a question. Oh, on. Yeah, great. I do on that topic. So one of the issues is that a lease might, might have the, the legal four people on it, but in fact that there are other people who are living there that it, uh, year round or, or whatever the, the duration of the lease. And so there may be often six or more people living in that same premises and um, being able to define who is an occupant and who is not, I think is fairly important. Mm -hmm. So because, because we don't want the non-occupants actually living there because that that increases the that increases the friction with mm -hmm. everything around that property. Right. And also more wear and tear and the Absolutely. town wouldn't know when it goes to license it. Yeah. Shalini and then Jennifer. Yeah, and related to that, when we're counting the unrelated people, so if there are, let's say, four unrelated people and one of them has a girlfriend, so they're kind of, they're really, like, it's a couple, they're a couple, so would that count as five or would that count as four are unrelated, but these two are related? So how do we count the numbers? It looks like the word resident, um, hold on, I believe it's in here. It says they're in alphabetical order, so it would, if resident would be lower. Thank you. I, I did go to school, like I really did. I thought. <laughs> um, so residential. I can't. I, I don't. We see might I not have resident. Find resident. Oh, here it is. This business about a student rental. So there, that language appears there. Um, one of our persons unrelated by blood marriage or legal adoption. So that seems to me what we're using or what's intended to be used as a standard for um, the unrelated people. It, it's basically saying you either need to be related by blood or there needs to be some legal document that says you're a couple or you're a, a you know, a, a care provider or a, whatever it might be. Jennifer? Yes. Well, first of all, I don't think we're trying to say that you're only, this is even why I raised my hand, but since it just came up, I mean, we're not trying to say you're only a couple if you're legally married or civil union. I think that's, yeah, you know, I, I don't think, you know, we're, we're that anyone's trying to, to define that. But I just wanted to say, I was really surprised. I was speaking with someone from one of the large uh, property management companies, and they said that in their lease, they actually say that um, like guests can't stay more than two nights, if I was hearing correctly. So I'm not saying that we want to put that in the bylaw, but I just thought it was interesting that legally they could do that in their lease. And I guess that's how they get around you know, if they're renting to four people of everybody, you know, having two friends, you know, come and live there on some, you know, longer short term basis. So I just want to share that. So I yeah, I, 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 I agree with that I, I do think that a landlord has the ability to say what the conditions are um, for the use of their property. And it is often the case that they limit the number of people that can live there and or the number of guests that can stay for a period of time. In fact, sometimes they have to move out for two weeks before they can move back in. Um, I, I guess what you're saying with the word occupant is that a person who is domiciled there. So it's not just that they came in overnight um, and you know they're, they're planning on leaving tomorrow. It's that they're there and they're not really planning to leave. Um, and so I can ask, um, Michael, who very good researcher, to go ahead and grab that definition, not right now, from the um, Hirschkopf B Register of Voters case. There is, there is a definition of domicile for voting purposes, 
I think we're trying to create a, um, a definition of domicile for rental purposes. Um, and so, you know, we, we can look at what some of those factors are that they use to identify whether a person is actually a resident and domiciled appropriately. Does that make sense? It does. I want to ask if Pam to clarify for her when she was saying we have we've heard there's experience where there are say six people living domiciled if we're thinking about that yeah. permanent living in a in a unit um, but only four are on the lease. Pam, are you trying to get this occupant to include all six of them or no. just those four? No, I would like it to. Well, our zoning bylaw limits the number, not this, not this bylaw. So I don't want to overrun or override our existing bylaw. Um, but I, but I, I just thought it would be helpful since we're talking about occupants um, that we could, we can point to who is actually an occupant because they're on a lease as opposed to someone who is domiciled there but is not on the lease because legally they can't be because they will exceed the, the occupancy limit. So that, you're essentially that, looking to differentiate between a person who is a legal occupant, meaning they've signed a lease mm -hmm. um, or someone else is paying for them um, as compared to someone who is domiciled there and unauthorized occupant or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I can I can see the difference there, and I I do I do echo your concerns about how zoning and this um, kind of get along. Um, so it's something to think about. We should look in the zoning bylaw how they define an occupant or a number of people. Maybe the answer is there for us, and we don't even need to be creative. So the zoning bylaw in twelve. Section 12.17 defines family, and there's four ways to create a family. Um, so that might help you. Um, the question I would have is, is, is that sort of occupants, you know, like, is that how we should be doing this then with occupants potentially? And then Jennifer, before you answer that, um, Jennifer. Yeah, and then the same section of the zoning bylaw, I think it's maybe 2.16. That may not be correct, but in the same section, then it defines um, a household, I think, with no more than four unrelated people. So that's where, so that section of the bylaw defines a family, and then it defines occupancy limits for those households that don't meet the family definition. Yeah. And so is it, is it, is it a good idea to, figure out how to use those definitions here to say as defined in the zoning bylaw, whatever. I or... think that's what it has now. I mean, now I think it doesn't it just say, you know, it refers to the zoning bylaw that the, the rental property bylaw complies with the zoning bylaw. Well, we refer to the zoning bylaw as a, it would be a violation of the permitting bylaw to if you violated the zoning bylaw. But I think, uh, Lauren, you were going with figure out maybe we don't want to define occupant, we want to define occupant as, or include the zoning definition of family and household or something in the definition of occupant or something. Because how are, I mean, if if the answer is that it's just a person whose name is on a lease, I mean, I have a child, I had to co-sign his lease. Um, I He didn't need to sign it at all, but, but he did because he works for himself, you know? Um, but I, I guess it's just, there's a lot of concepts here. And if there's a way to kind of boil down some of those concepts to things that the town already understands, then that may be useful. Um, you know, I think that one of the themes in my head when I was reading through this is there's just, there's a lot here. And it, it seems like, let's, let's leave the landlords and the tenants out of it for now. It seems like there's a lot for the town to do. Um, and that, you know, that, when, when you're establishing a permitting scheme like that, right? You, you wanna make sure that you can do it, the town can do it. And so it, every bylaw and every regulation is not enforced 100% of the time and that's fine. As long as it's not enforced in a, um, you know, in an illegal way, meaning I don't like you because you're th this or that, or, you know, trying to, uh, you know, uh, treat someone in, a, in an inappropriate manner like, 
you know, that whatever. So that that issue, it doesn't have to be enforced. The inspection requirement doesn't have to be enforced um, 100 percent of the time. Right. But if it's going to be enforced 100 percent of the time, you know, the, I started thinking about like what records are we going to keep of that and where are they going to go? You know, maybe we'll scan them all now that we're all super, super techie. Um, but if if you did a permit by dwelling unit, for example, I know that's one of your questions. Can you imagine how many permits you'd have to issue? And then each inspection would be a separate form. Um, and then, you know, each license. So dwelling unit one has a problem, dwelling unit two doesn't. Now you are giving a having a hearing on dwelling unit one and you know, dwelling unit two is right there they don't have the hearing i i just i think there's some thought on the on the side of what kind of scheme do we create internally to make sure that this works and then take a look back at the bylaw and what it says to see does that match you know are we are we creating something that we can actually do um and and some of that has to do with the fact that People, people know when you have a lease, you are um, entitled to the quiet enjoyment of your property. Even the landlord has limited rights as to whether they can enter and under what conditions. And so, um, you know, it, it is anytime we get near there, get near we're going in, like there has to be a thought about, is there a due process issue? Are people able to appeal? Do they have the right to have a hearing about that before you know, their permit is pulled, et cetera. So I, I think that kind of thing kind of layers onto this. You know, are we gonna do that for 75 units in one building? Or are we gonna say, landlord, you have 75 units that need to be corrected, that's these, and that's one hearing. So again, I think, you know, just how are we gonna do this is a, is a good question to be asking now. Jennifer. Uh, yes, I just wanted to clarify because that would be very complicated if we were trying to do one permit per unit it's more there would be one rental permit for the building but how would we price it i mean that's really mm -hmm. what we're we might price per unit or per some group of units one permit um if you don't hate me changing the subject a little bit i wanted to address the the fees aspect of this as well um so the emerson test and i'm sure you already know this but i'm just repeating it because obviously I like to hear myself talk. Um, it basically says that any fee that you impose has to be reasonably related to the cost to the town. And so, you know, that's, yes, I think a, an, an, a permit fee for a building with 50 units is really different than a building with two. Um, and so I do think that's reasonably related, but, but bear in mind, we're counting these costs like one time. So, if we're inspecting and um, you know, I, we need to make sure that when, if we go back for a reinspection, that we're not bringing the cost of that initial inspection to the cost of the reinspection. So I, I do, um, I noticed that the fee section is, is very specific. There's a, a significant number of fees and each one will have to be calculated based upon the reasonable cost of the town. It doesn't have to be exact. It's not required by law to be exact. Um, and you're allowed to include things like lights and computers and, you know, heat and that kind of stuff in, in that calculation. But you do have to have a calculation to be able to demonstrate, yeah, this is reasonable. It's reasonably related because X. So I don't know if you have all those fees in place right now um, that, that are mentioned in the fee section, but it's a good idea to kind of check and to say, you know, what what are we what are we including in this application fee? How how does it relate to what the the town is uh, contributing? Want an answer right now? <laughs> oh. we do have a fee structure, but um, no, that that's some good advice I think as we talk more about the draft fees that that you saw, which were really just placeholders and numbers at some point and talk about the drafts. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So I'm just looking at the questions quickly. Um, okay. So the issue of student rental and whether student rental is 
um, student rentals should be, or, or units, dwellings with student rentals treated differently than, re than rentals out with, not, uh, with, no, with no students. Um, again, I think as you're going through this, you know, there has to be a, a, an explainable, rational basis for making that decision. And I think, um, you know, obviously protection of students is the rational reason and but you need to be able to articulate why are they more vulnerable are they less able to um you know to to speak up because they don't know how um are these you know they don't have lawyers each one of them a lot of people especially you know that go to a state school might have a significant scholarship and so you know they're not um you know they don't have the ability to pay more based on what you know what someone says oh that's going to cost you more money and so is the is the goal to make sure that they're safer um and i think and and that that all the codes are being complied with so that they aren't put at in in additional danger pam i'd like to respond to that and i think if you look across college towns um, with you know, with universities in larger universities in them, there have been uh, there have been guidelines in place for in some cases forty years. Mm -hmm. Amherst is not, you know, we're forty years kind of late here. Um, students, you're never late. Are you kidding me? You guys are on the cutting edge. Yeah, right now we are. Um, student student activity tends to differ from. Um, families who have to put their kids to bed at seven o'clock at night or who are um, just in just in basic uh, activity levels and activity time frames and we understand that that there are uh, yes they yes they need protection they have every protection under state law for tenants rights um, we just had a seminar the other day about that. Um, so I think the intent of the intent of part of this bylaw is there are a number of dwelling units in town that are not in good condition, mm -hmm. that are probably unsafe and unhealthy, and those students, you're right, do not have uh, necessarily the wherewithal or the financial means to push back sometimes, and there is such a drive to accommodate students mm -hmm. off campus that they're really stuck. It's, mm -hmm. it's really not the student's fault. That said, a number of these units are in the middle of neighborhoods with the children riding bicycles on the street or trying to be uh, enjoying their quiet enjoyment, mm -hmm. their properties, and ha having no information on what is uh, uh, housing occupied by students as opposed to not students. Um, I think is something that helps us strategize how we spend town resources, mm -hmm. how, how we work, you know, both with fire department, police department, inspection services. It's something that it's data that we really that we really need to know. Right. That's useful to the town because it's a basis for making decisions about services right. and um, and the need for services. And I do think. I mean, I, I think that um, that in a place like Amherst where everything is up for grabs, right? Like, you know, the, the students want what they want. And we had the, the case a few years ago where a student um, wanted us to change the day of the primary or something like that because they're just getting back from school. And, you know, and all of that makes sense. And it's great to have an active student body like that. But it, I do agree that the there are several factors that I think um, emphasize the need for that kind of a distinction. One of them is the temporary nature of residence. Um, because most students don't rent for four years, they rent for one year and or for half a semester because you know someone goes away and another friend moves in. So that's another reason why it's useful. Um, you know, you're only allowed to vote if you're domiciled in the town of Amherst. And so, you know, that's another thing that um, if people aren't 
using their real address, you know, should they be voting in that location? So I, I do think that that there is a value of that. And also, God forbid something should happen, you know, we want to be able to communicate with UMass and UMass with us. Yeah. So that's that's why I see the where I see the difference. Um, and the other difference is things like um, noise or activity or something. Those there's already existing town, you know, there's existing state laws and there's existing town stuff. So I again I think the kind of thinking about what is that rational basis? You know, if if we had to go before a judge, are we going to go before a judge and say blank? And what, what would a judge think of that? Um, and I should remind you that that I know you know that the AG reviews bylaws in towns. And so the AG goes through with a fine tooth comb, makes me look lax, like relaxed. And that is not the thing. Um, and picks out all these little things. And some of the things they strike because they say it's inconsistent with state law and the constitution. Some things they don't strike, but they say, hey, this could be a liability later on. So, you know, I think also thinking about what would be subject to challenge and why, who would be the challenger um, and, uh, you know, kind of looking at it from that, um, from that viewpoint, like, Mandy Joe, when you guys were doing the charter, I think I said something like, hey, you can propose anything you want, but you got to make sure you can sell it. So I think, you know, that's another issue here in terms of, are you going to be able to, and I don't mean sell it, but are you going to be able to make a case to a judge? There really is a rational basis for this. And I think there are lots and lots of ex examples that you can bring to it. Um, but I do think that if if we're using this instead of some other applicable, you know, bylaw or law or code, et cetera, it's much more likely that a court's gonna deal with that part. You know, if there's a state sanitary code violation and the code officer goes to enforce it, you can bet that, um, you know, that is going to be the issue that a court looks at. If we then say, look, if that happens to you four more times, you might lose, blah, 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 they're still going to go back to, is that a safe space? You know, is that building up to code? Um, so again, I think just kind of thinking through that theme as you go through, who might challenge this and why? Okay. Um, Jennifer first, and then I oh, wonder sorry. if we can move farther down on our question list, just being mindful of some time. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say a lot of what's in here, we're not looking at changing. I mean, you know, exactly. So, certainly with occupancy, we're not looking at changing it. So it's been there for years and mm -hmm. hasn't been an issue. Since, since 2014. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's what happens, I think, when you look at a bylaw, when you're making changes, you know, you look to see, does everything work together? Is adding this going to bring more attention to that? And so, you know, I, I, uh, that's that's how I look at it anyway. You know, is that because I have to have a resident manager? Does that make me, um, you know, am I saying I don't have the money for that, or I don't want to pay someone, or um, you know, Joe lives here and he's always done that, and you know, we have an agreement. So those things, you know, are are, are just things to keep in mind. All right, is information provided on the application public? Yes. Because if you have to submit something to get a permit, then what you submit is a public record. There may be people who have other reasons why they don't want their name or address to be revealed. Um, and, you know, like a restraining order that um, authorizes a person to use a code, like a different name for their transactions or, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, federal government witness, there's, there are some of those. They wouldn't, this wouldn't change that. Even though this says it's public, it's subject to state and federal law. So I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, and certainly case by case consideration of issues is never out of the question. You know, it really is part of the job of licensing. So I think, you know, a discussion could be had, do we need this piece of information? Do we want it? Um, and 
So, so that's where that's where I am for that. And so looking at the questions on the application or what the, the town is asking for is important because now you're a caretaker of that information. And um, and it is subject to disclosure upon request unless it is, you know, fits into one of those very narrow um, exemptions. Well, um, I told you you're on the cutting edge because I have never in my I, I'm not good at math. 22 plus four, 26 years of practice seen anywhere where the B structure is split with one entity doing it first and then a second. That being said, I don't think it's prohibited. Um, I guess one of the things that surprised me is that, um, you know, that the, I can see that the council would want to, approve those regulations or at least be confer uh, have a con uh, conferral right so you know is there a public hearing requirement to change the regulations and I, I don't and I don't think there is but especially with something like this um, a really big change in the regulations could change the entire nature of the enforcement program so I would add I mean I would consider whether we want to require the licensing board to confer with the council in the future, or whether we want to say that, you know, these regulations can be amended time to time following two weeks notice and opportunity for a hearing, something like that. But it can be done this way. Yes. Okay. I don't see anything, I don't see why it can't be, but I also have never seen it before. You, you know, that's why I said cutting edge. Um, Okay, disclosure notification. So we deal with this all the time, not this type of disclosure, but we um, we usually say that uh, trying to enforce this would be so difficult that, you know, are we gonna, we could ask the realtors, will you hand this out when you are, or we can ask the landlords, will you hand this out? But the reality is we have no idea and they're not likely to hold on to that sheet forever and ever and ever. So one thing that you can just do is kind of what they did with the, um, you know, they were creating uh, farm friendly towns and farm commissions. They basically said, you know, this town is blah, 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 and it shall be posted at, and then they'd say on the website in a prominent location at the clerk's office, um, at the assessor's office, where people will likely go if they're buying a home or renting a home, you know, to change your address, you can do it online, but a lot of people walk in and do it at the clerk's office. So, you know, I, I, I think this is one of those things where the way you want to do this may be harder than doing it a different way and not having to worry about enforcing that as well. And, you know, people are gonna come to the website if they're looking to move here and they're gonna see that. But again, if we have it posted publicly, you know, I, I, I find it hard to believe that people could miss it. Don't agree, Pam? <laughs> yeah, well. Is it something we could potentially require be put in like property tax notices through the bylaw? I'm just thinking certainly. of potential other ways. Mm -hmm. Yep, or be included with the annual census, something of that nature. And I would recommend giving it to the realtors and giving it to the landlords as part of their, you know, their permit, they should get a few copies of that, of that information so that can be passed along. And, you know, not everyone's going to do it, but certainly if we make it easy for them, they'd be more likely to, more likely to. So that's something to think about. Also, and I know this sounds ridiculous and we're not putting it in the bylaw, but print it on a brightly colored piece of paper. Do not send it on just a plain white paper because people don't. They don't, they can't, they're like, I have 17 pieces of white paper, but putting it on a bright color is definitely an attention getter. All right. Um, so this part, the next part, the consent issue, um, you know, as I said earlier, it's kind of like every time we add something on to, to the requirements. It's okay, so it's well down there. 
Oh gosh, yes it is. But you just passed it. I love that you've memorized this. I just saw K go by. That's yeah. why. That that's about where it is. Okay. Yeah. Good. So um, the text that we have in here already that's not uh, a different color is the text that's in the existing bylaw. Correct. Um, not all of it. Okay. So. I guess my um, my take on this is the the Constitution and it says something like towns can make bylaws that aren't inconsistent with law but can't interfere in the landlord tenant relationship something like that or laws relative to um, to uh, landlord tenant and if you want to look for that it's in the um, the Home Rule Amendment actually it's I think it's Section Six. Um, and it's a kind of, it, the way it's enforced, especially, I mean, because we have lots of examples of it from the attorney general. And it's, it also says you can't make laws relative to elections. And it's true, but you can do it if it doesn't interfere with the state laws relative to elections. Um, so, you know, my inclination is to say, it, we don't know that every landlord is going to use the same lease, right? We just don't know. And so by kind of, by requiring that in the, in the lease, um, you know, essentially we're asking each landlord to alter their lease to contain that information. Um, I think even if it did include a consent, it wouldn't change the fact that there would have to be a reasonable notice and authority, um, you know, under the particular circumstances at issue. And, and so we can, you know, even though boards of health have the right to go on properties to address, you know, life and death uh, health situations, we often go to court and get um, an authority. We get a warrant to go and go inside their house. And so, you know, I think if we're saying, you know, it's once a year or once every three years and it needs to be in lease, I, I can see that being acceptable. But I do think that what they're agreeing to. The landlord isn't agreeing to us coming in at will, and not, nor is the tenant. Um, even in, in housing that municipalities own, we have to provide significant notice and, um, you know, and, and be sure that the individual is essentially uh, cooperating in terms of getting into their apartment. So you have there subject to and as limited by the laws of the Commonwealth. And, you know, that essentially is a, it, you can have it there. And then if someone challenges it, you wind up, you know, discussing how, how to implement this and whether it was reasonable or not reasonable. Um, I think it's more perhaps just an acknowledgement that the town has this bylaw and, um, that the landlord acknowledges it because we're giving notice to the landlord that they have to comply with this bylaw as part of the application uh, packet and the permit. Um, so the tenants not complying makes the landlord out of compliance. So I don't, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think the tenants have the rights they have under state law and under the terms of their lease already as to whether someone can go in their home or not for an inspection. Um, and I saw that your proposed inspection schedule is what, seven days notice at least. And um, I, I forget what the other, yeah, seven calendar days advance notice. I mean, that's a lot. Um, and it says, make a good faith effort to arrange access. Okay. Um, but if you don't, for example, uh, if you aren't allowed access, then they then the town can't go in there. Now, with the initial permit application being dependent upon uh, the acquisition of a permit, you're putting certain requirements in the, in the permit application that you know that you will manage in that in that way. Um, so, I do think that the landlords can be held accountable for that. I'll I'll stop talking and listen. I think there's gonna be a lot of questions. We'll start with Shalini. 
One of the concerns we heard from the tenants in the surveys we did was that landlord, some of the landlords would just enter without, and this is not regarding inspections. Mm -hmm. So what is a state law or uh, that protects tenants from landlords entering? And uh, I think the reason for putting all the things in this one place is because many tenants note, noted that they didn't know where to find what and so. Mm -hmm. Um, so I believe I don't have the tenant's bill of rights, uh, access to it right now, but I am virtually certain it says that there has to be notice, um, to enter. And a lot of times it'll say like notice to enter for code inspections and to re-rent it if you're not going to redo your lease. Um, so I don't think there is the right to come in randomly. Um, but certainly, especially if, you know, students want, are watching this, read the lease, you know, cause if it does say that, you can cross it out. You don't have to agree to that term, so. Um, John John is um, our town inspector, so he might wanna comment on some of what they do. T John. It's 24 hours, 24 hours notice. <clears throat> Landlords have to give that, and that's what we ask for as well. Mm -hmm. And so is that the minimum, like we could change the seven calendar days to 24 hours if we wanted to? Yep. Can I ask a question to John, Mandy Jo? Yes. Um, John, if you have authority to enter for, or if there is authority to enter because there's a health or safety issue, um, you know, we're essentially saying someone, you know, this house is going to fall down, we're going in. We go and get a permit for inspections, routine inspections. I, I can understand that there would be a shorter um, time but I do wonder here where there's, there is uh, a middle person. And so I think the seven calendar days actually is helpful for, um, for addressing potential due process issues. Yeah, we have, to, we have to get a search warrant. We can't just go in. Exactly, exactly. So that's, I think, what the important message is. We're not, the town isn't just walking into people's houses to do inspections or anything else. We have authority under state law, but continue to go to court to get a search warrant because I'm not a search warrant, a warrant allowing entrance um, so that, you know, so that the town is protected in potential lawsuits. So my, my question is, is it possible, you know, it sounds like tenants would always have a right, even for a, you know, an inspection that's required to obtain a permit to say no to that inspection. Um, if the, if the dwelling unit is occupied, is it then possible for us to refuse to issue a permit because an inspection hasn't occurred within that amount of time? Or would that be problematic under landlord tenant law? Um, good question which is my way of stalling for thinking a minute. Um, I think that puts us in the middle of potential problems because we're essentially putting ourselves in the middle of the landlord and the tenant, right? We're saying, you know, we're gonna go in there even if you don't say yes, but it's the tenant really who gets the choice. And I feel as though if, if the tenant says no, and you know John thinks it's an emergency, he's going to go and get a twenty-four hour notice and go in. Um, so I think there's a remedy already for that, and um, you know, especially with code enforcement, like they exist for a reason, and it's to protect people. And so you know, if people won't cooperate with that, then we go and have the force of the law and the court behind us to go and do that. Um, so I, you know, again. It could be on the disclosure, you know, this is, you may be asked to, um, to make your, pro your uh, dwelling unit available for inspections in order to comply with the blah, blah, blah uh, section of, of the residential rental bylaw. And I think, you know, that's notice. It's different. It's not saying um, we're going to come in at any time. <clears throat> so And I, again, I, I do think tenants have some, <clears throat> and I could look it up, but the tenant bill of rights is that they, they do have to allow reasonable access to the owner or the management company because it belongs to them. 
as compared to for us, I mean, for, for rental per, rental unit purposes, the tenant has now not agreed, not lived up to the provisions of their lease, there's contract issues, and then there may be, you know, um, code violation issues that need to be addressed. So where it says subject to and as limited by the laws of the Commonwealth, um, you know, it, maybe you give a choice as to where it goes. So you say um, the lease for a dwelling unit or other whatever shall be accompanied by the from the blah blah from the owner. Is it going to happen every time? We don't we don't know. But it would again if we're like giving it to them when they come in for their application and we're putting it on bright pink paper or something, it's more likely that that it's easier for them to just pass that along. And then if some management companies want to put it in the lease or some owners do, then great. It's not our problem. And if some don't, you know, we we at least have taken the step to make them aware of the issues. Thanks. Any other questions on this consent section? I think we should go on to violations, enforcement, and penalties then. All right. What page is that on? Uh, you're already in it. Okay. Good. <laughs> it's on like four pages. It's long. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Um, violation. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's fine. Um, one of the issues that I saw is this um, denial of a permit because of violations. Um, you had mentioned in your questions, well, you know, if a property owner has X number of violations, then that can result in a denial. And I, I, I agree that it could. I think they have to be provided with notice and the opportunity for a hearing to comply with due process. And um, perhaps uh, as well, you know, there, there might be some concern over, you know, landlord one had a lot of problems in the past year. And so they, you know, make a, a private corporation, a closely held corporation to take that property to own that property for year two. So I do think you could say, you know, if there are X many violations um, of this bylaw on any property under this, um, you know, under uh, that's regulated here, that a certain number of them over a certain time period could lead to that. So maybe it's, you know, two years, right? And if it's a different owner, I'm just putting it in quotes, that, that's a question. I mean, the licensing commission has the ability and should, you know, take a look at that. If that's gonna change, and, and it does say if the owners change that that's gonna, they have to be notified. So it may be that they say, hey, you need to come in. Um, you know, we need to talk about this. Uh, it may be that if they have a violation, they have to come in and, um, or they have the opportunity to come in. But I think anything that has um, a significant effect on a person's property or their use of their property that we're imposing, we wanna make sure that, again, it makes, it makes sense. There's a, there's a rational basis for it. And also that it doesn't, have unintended consequences. For example, you know, there could be property that's owned by one entity for three years, <clears throat> the brother, and then the other brother says, you, you aren't handling this well, and that's not what dad or mom wanted when they left us the building. I'm gonna take care of it from now on. I'm gonna be the owner. Um, you know, I'll buy you out. Is that the same? Is it different? They were both owners. I, we just don't know. And so if the new owner is, um, you know, paying a price basically for what happened three years ago. I think they have arguments about whether, you know, that is an interference with their ability to, to um, use their property for a legal purpose or interference with a contract or um, even, you know, even regulatory taking possibilities could be, um, could be argued. So I think, you know, that I think we have to find some good discrete period of time that accomplishes what you want, which is these units to be in good shape. 
right? So if, if an owner proves to be unreliable, um, you know, and, and there are a ton of violations and they sell it to someone who is really still themselves, they sell it to a corporation, that would be investigated, right? You, you can look at the corporate, the corporate um, documents on the Secretary of State's website and the, the licensing commission would have the ability to ask questions. Um, but I think going back further than that and not, and, and holding someone else accountable for a previous owner's failures is, is pushing, <clears throat> pushing the limits if it's extensive. You know, I think a two-year look back, I can see that, that makes sense. Um, a five-year look back, you know, people keep, people can turn around in, in five years and, um, it should be a, a decision based on the current facts. Um, and could include um, as a, uh, you know, a, a, it might, you might have a list like potential um, reasons for, for denial and, you know, have a list in there about that kind of thing, you know, repeated problems at this address um, over time, regardless of the owner and that, because of that situation, unless they can demonstrate that they're gonna handle it differently, the commission isn't comfortable giving them the permit. Thank you, Pam. Oh, I, I'm not sure exactly how to phrase this as, as a statement or a question. Um, if, the, if the reason for um, closure or, la, or denial of a permit, yes, I, I totally agree we should have uh, a fair hearing, a process um, <clears throat> for consideration of that. But um, how do we how do we uh, enforce that the 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 tenants, the activity or the behavior of the tenants mm -hmm. could very heavily be um, a factor, could be the primary factor in wanting yeah. to deny a, a permit. How does how does our um, Clamping down on a on a uh, on a behavior or a series of behaviors uh, affect the tenant um, landlord relationship. Well, I, I don't know if there's an answer to that that can be a you know a yes or no or how does I, I think that we create individual as applied issues if we're holding a landlord accountable under this, I, I actually had the, the thought of, <clears throat> what if the landlord and the tenant don't get along and the tenant calls in complaints and calls in complaints and calls, or you know files a complaint, files a complaint. And this then would shift the expense to the landlord of that, even though the landlord was being harassed. Now, I, I know that's not the intent, but it's a possibility. Um, the other thing is, is it um, it does it creates a, a a perhaps a disincentive to have people who are younger or you know going to be um, <clears throat> there for a shorter time a disincentive to rent to them in some ways because then as a landlord, you're like, yeah, I can't control these kids or I can't control the, that group of people. I really don't want that responsibility. I'm going <clears> to <throat> try and focus my renting to, uh, to other applicants. Now, they can't discriminate under the Fair Housing Act, and I'm not suggesting that this would. I'm just saying I wonder if that's kind of an unintended consequence of, of, that, of shifting all that to the landlord. Um, I failed to mention something that I want to make sure that I, I do say. So I also don't think the look back can be based on insignificant violations. Um, I think if it's like there was a torn screen, I mean, I, I was talking with someone about this today, as you can see, you had me all, uh, all, all uh, ready for any questions that might come. Um, like, would we really think that having a, a broken screen, which is a violation, for which a notice, you know, for which a uh, fine can be levied. Is that a reason not to reauthorize a permit? So I think one of the 
correct, maybe if there's a few more criteria here to bulk up the, the rational basis, that that would be a great idea. Perhaps, for example, that any violation that um, is, uh, is confirmed after an appeal or is, uh, you know, has, um, there's always that, that there is an opportunity for um, a um, notice and a hearing for those things. Because you can guess, I mean, you know, I, I think I would be, I think it would be problematic if someone said, you know, <clears throat> gee, the screen's been broken there for three years, we're not gonna give you a new permit. And we've, we've given you a ton of, of violations. And yeah, that's, that's bad behavior. I didn't pay my violations, but I didn't ever have a hearing. Like, so I could demonstrate that maybe it wasn't in violation. So I think the look back, we want to kind of insulate from, from due process issues by saying it has to be something for which there was an opportunity, there was notice and opportunity for a hearing. Does that seem, Mandy Joe? does that seem wrong to you? So I... I think we have to think about how that would work into this if we're doing something like that and and how to do that. It, it goes to the question I was going to ask or part of the question I was going to ask, um, which is, you know, in some sense, what is significant uh, is one of the questions that came up. But when we were talking about tenant behavior, um, there, you know, if you look at the regulations, which CRC has not discussed at all, so I don't know where CRC will end up, but other states, particularly State College, have regulations with this point system that say an assault on the property, if taken to, you know, final adjudication in criminal court, constitutes this adds points to this system, and you get enough of them, and the permit is suspended. It, is it? It, given Massachusetts landlord tenant law, are we allowed to hold the landlord responsible for tenant behavior? And there's a whole wide range of tenant behavior, you know, ignore sometimes the tenants, the one that does disable the fire system you know, and, and things like that. But, but thinking about noise complaints on parties or littering on the lawn, despite you know, the landlord having trash pickup or something, you know, versus, and then to, to the, to further things of just plain criminal behavior on the tenant's part of, you know, assault, battery, things like that. Well, I can tell you that when I was reading all this little, you know, questions were like popping up in bubbles, like in cartoons, and they really were that kind of, of issue. Um, First of all, I think we can require landlords to use their property in an appropriate manner. That's what we're doing here, right? We're saying you're going to have an appropriate, you know, uh, level of compliance with code, et cetera. And that's easy to justify. Um, you know, there's a case that we actually have. I, I, I'll try and find it um, where we went to court to try to take a motel or hotel license away from a particular motel or hotel where there was a lot of you know, criminal behavior. And it was a tough slog. Um, it really was because the owner, basically the hotel motel argued, like we followed the rules, we followed the laws, you know, look what these people did. You know, we can't be expected to monitor them. They have their own responsibilities. Um, I don't remember how that case turned out, but I do think again, I kind of think of this as like a sliding scale and I, it, that may be a useful kind of analogy. The more things we like pile on that create a burden on the landlord, the more potentially the l landlords will not like that, right? And, and say, hey, you know, why are we carrying the boat on, the, I mean, carrying the ball on this? Why isn't that? Why isn't it good enough that if an assault happens and the police arrest the person, like that's that's the remedy. There is an assault with a police officer arresting someone. The other thing is, and I'm not sure about this, non-criminally, I, I don't think it matters, but if someone is accused of a crime, they typically can only be prosecuted 
one time by one entity, right? And so I wonder whether tenant representatives would argue that, um, or landlord representatives, that the problem about this person who did this bad thing is that person's problem. And the landlord, you know, if, if they punish the, the landlord, that the landlord, you know, is essentially being punished for something that is a crime committed by someone else who's being punished for that under under criminal law. It's like um is it, it's like a piggyback piggyback um issue. Plus, what are we going to do with uh, I mean, it doesn't say in here I think as clearly as maybe we wanted to about that those need to be adjudicated matters. Um you know, it's not if someone commits a crime and it's just an accusation or what if it's continued without a finding or um, you know, it stays on the record for five years and it's expunged. There, I think there are a lot of individual issues that could come up with this. Um, again, I kind of go back to, are they complying with code? So the code violations are the most concrete thing to approach these issues. And yeah, under the state sanitary code, if the um, you know the the landlord isn't complying, that's going to affect everyone. If um, and and yeah, everyone's everyone's kind of paying a price for that. But we have the ability to force them to do that. Here, bad acts can occur and can have nothing to do with the landlord at all. The landlord certainly wouldn't want you know criminal behavior to happen on their property. Um, I, I think it is, it is definitely the case once it's been adjudicated and it's a, fi a criminal finding, a, a, a guilty finding, then I think you could say that, um, you know, that's, that's, a, an issue. Um, but the other thing that happened, like, is that, does this crime have to happen in Amherst? I mean, there's people that live all over the place, you know, the, the nearby three counties, what if the crime happens somewhere else, but they live in Amherst? Like, are, how are we going to even know about that? Um, so I, I, I think that there's some practical implementation issues. And um, I know as well that, as we were talking about earlier, the goal here really isn't to make trouble for landlords. It's to make sure that landlords are keeping their properties in an appropriate condition. And so, you know, Perhaps we we think about whether um, you know with a warning or this or you know the first time it's a it's a warning the second time it's a fine the third time it's whatever but maybe we also put in here that you know appropriate services will be um, the town will connect them with appropriate services or something like that um, you know again to to get compliance is really the goal so that's those are those are Food for thought. Thank you. I'm mindful of the time, so I want to offer CRC members one last opportunity to ask questions right now. Um, I, I am guessing that if you have additional questions based on this conversation and thinking that I can collect them and send them to Paul, who will then send them to uh, Attorney Goldberg for additional expounding on them and all. And certainly this will not be the only time because when we finally get to cl much closer to a final draft, um, you'll get to see it again. <laughs> and you'll get to see the regulations again and all. Um, but this is more- that it's a yeah. draft, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's It's got a lot of really important concepts in there. And I think that, you know, how to how to make them work is going to be is going to be part of the struggle. So, um, you know, maybe it is talking to all the inspectors and, um, you know, to the court and to um, what was I said, the police chief and the fire chief, health director to say, you know, what do you do? Like, what's your policy? Um, you know, we can go in and give someone a, a ticket for, um, you know, a, a a bylaw violation, like a dirty front yard or something, um, or like they left cars out there or there's tires and big circles or whatever it is. Um, 
we can issue a, a violation notice for that and then they clean it up. You know, is that something that counts for this purpose of, you know, prior complaints? So I, I do think there's those issues need to be sorted. Any final questions for now from committee members? I want to say to Attorney Goldberg, and I know um, Attorney D'Ortenzio was very quiet, but I, yes. I want to thank uh, both of you for coming today. Um, I, I personally thought it was very helpful as we continue on in this process to, to hear your thoughts. Um, so thank you for taking the time out and for being willing to come and, and answer our questions. And, and we look forward to hearing more, <laughs> as I'm sure we will. And I um, look forward to seeing more. So thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you for thank having you. me. We, I really appreciate being asked to participate. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of nice for me to be able to say, I'm super conservative about this. And so, you know, my final comments may not be what you would hope, but it doesn't mean that, you know, I don't think that the work is impressive or that I don't understand the goal. So it's nice to have a chance to say that rather than just send comments saying, have you considered da da da? So, yes. thank so you. So thank, thank you. Um, we're gonna move on um, to general public comment. It's the only other thing we're going to do on our agenda. We will move the minutes adoption to next week's meeting. Um, and we will also move the associate member vacancies to, I think actually based on what Pam sent today, two, two meetings from now, given the timeline that um, Pam Rooney gave for those ZBA vacancy responses. So um, we're done with you, Attorney Goldberg. So <laughs> feel free to Thank have you. a nice evening. Um, okay, you too. Thanks and again. Yep, and at this time, so public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC are going to be accepted at this time. Um, residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes, well, for three minutes. Um, and we generally do not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter that is raised during public comment. Um, after public comment, I did see your hand, Pam, um, we'll go to anything that needs said after public comment before we adjourn the meeting. Um, so with that, um, Renata Shepard, please un unmute yourself and make your public comment. Hi, um, Renata Shepard from Justice Drive. Um, that was very informative and very helpful. Um, and I have a couple of comments. Um, you know, I'm against the restriction regarding the person in charge. Uh, you put an age and you know requirement there. And what if one of my adult children, for instance, you know, 18, 21, 24, who are <laughs> I have four children, uh, who are responsible and want to, you know, be in the family business is the person in charge. You know, we've had state representatives younger than 25. Uh, their restriction uh, is unreasonable. And as you know, Attorney Grover mentioned, the uh, ultimate responsibility is the owners or the landlord. Um, if the owner finds the person in charge is adequate, why would the town you know, interfere, interject itself in, in that professional choice? 18 is actually the legal adult age. Uh, regarding removing the ability you know, to rent a property for over a number of years uh, should not apply if the property is sold or transferred. Otherwise, you are impacting on sale value. Uh, um, like if I decide to sell a property to an investor and, and you are affecting my ability to do so, you know, it's a legal liability, I would assume, um, as, you know, for attorney Goldberg, you know, holding someone else accountable. Um, it shouldn't even be considered, I think. And uh, she has touched on several issues that I and other landlords have raised uh, before as landlord concerns, such as tenants retaliating against landlords, discrimination, uh, confidentiality, etc. And I like her. She's on top of it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Renata. Um, there are no other hands raised um, for public comment, so that closes our public comment period. As I said, we will move minutes to the November 3rd meeting because I promised we'd be done this meeting at 6.30 and no later than that. Um, I will have an amended agenda out for the November 3rd meeting tomorrow. Um, so it, there's one posted right now because there are public hearings on set for that meeting, but I will be amending it based on this. And so, that will that that's my next agenda preview. Look for it tomorrow. Um, any other announcements, comments, questions? 
um, before I adjourn the meeting. Seeing none, I'm adjourning the meeting at 6.29 p.m. Thank you all, and thank you, Robin, John, and Dave, for and Athena, for all being here for the two hours. Have a nice evening. Bye. Mm.